Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Today we have a very special guest, Anthony Pompliano, best known as Pomp. Welcome to the channel. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you for the time. So maybe for the Spanish speaking community that don't know you that well, uh, can you briefly introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, Anthony Pompliano. Uh, most people know me as Pomp. Um, I am a investor and entrepreneur uh, and have been focused on uh, crypto, Bitcoin, blockchain uh, industry for a number of years now. Uh, prior to that, uh, served uh, for a number of years in the U.S. Army, uh, built and sold two technology companies and also ran a number of product and growth teams at uh, both Facebook and uh, Snapchat. Fantastic. I will put all the all your information in the description of the video for the people who want to check it out. And Anthony, so I don't want to start with the typical questions that everyone is talking about. I would like to talk about, let's start with DeFi and the evolution of the technology regarding that topic, because the majority of the project, DeFi is a big topic. It's a market that has been created that is going to be the big, uh, door for a lot of institutions to come into the space also. So the majority of the projects have been built on the Ethereum blockchain. And I would like to know your thoughts regarding the possibility of building those on top of Bitcoin. And, uh, and this is also uh, related to side chains and how the technology is evolving in that sense. What are your thoughts uh, regarding this topic? Yeah, so the way I think about this is um, it, it's kind of a side-by-side -side comparison, right? In the Bitcoin ecosystem, you have uh, something that's proven to be sound money, uh, but it's surrounded by centralized infrastructure. Uh, so all of the exchanges, the wallets, all, you know, the lending products, et cetera, it's all centralized uh, around that sound money. Then when you go to kind of the, um, the Ethereum ecosystem, you have decentralized infrastructure. So you have, you know, all the DEXs, you've got uh, all sorts of lending protocols and, and uh, products and services, et cetera. But then those things are surrounding uh, what looks like a fiat currency, right? ETH is a fiat currency for all intents and purposes uh, in terms of the way that it's structured. And so what ends up happening is you have a mismatch where you need to get that decentralized digital sound money currency uh, with decentralized infrastructure. And so there's two ways that can happen. Either you bring Bitcoin to um, kind of the ETH uh, DeFi world, or you bring the idea of decentralized infrastructure to Bitcoin. Um, we already see people trying to bring Bitcoin to uh, the DeFi space, uh, things like WBTC, TBTC, um, et cetera. Uh, so there's plenty of people who are kind of working on, uh, let's bring Bitcoin into the existing DeFi ecosystem. There's a number of other companies that are actually building decentralized infrastructure for Bitcoin. Um, so rather than bring Bitcoin over, they're actually bringing the infrastructure over. Uh, many of those companies have not yet been announced. Uh, we've actually invested uh, in, in one of them. And uh, it's something where I, I don't know who's going to win. Uh, I have my opinion. I obviously think that building the decentralized infrastructure around Bitcoin is going to be kind of the better long-term strategy. But those are kind of the two paths that people are pursuing. And the ultimate goal is how do you match Bitcoin with decentralized infrastructure uh, in some form or fashion? Yeah, no, I totally agree with your point. I heard you saying it and I wanted to bring it to the channel. And I think sidechains, for example, is a tech from a technical perspective, a topic that everyone should be following right now. And following this line in terms of technical perspective, what do you think we as an ecosystem, as a, as a, as a market, should be focusing more in terms of the evolution of the technology? Let's say for the following two years, what matters most right now? Yeah, people hate this answer, but it's just time. Um, I, I tend to think that uh, most of what we are going to see around adoption is going to just be time. Um, and what I mean by that is more people have to learn about uh, Bitcoin. Um, they have to learn about the decentralized infrastructure. They have to have the actual time pass where they get screwed in the legacy system, whether it's through inflation, um, confiscation, you know, all of the issues that we see in the legacy world. And that stuff takes time. 
Um, along with that, developers need time to actually build the products, right? And, and actually get the things in a place where they can handle millions or tens of millions of people using them. And so time is kind of, to me, uh, one, it's a great answer because it, I think it's right. Uh, but two, also, uh, then what it does is it shifts what's the onus on you, me, and everybody else. It's patience. Right? Don't, don't expect this to happen overnight. Don't get frustrated when it doesn't happen overnight. It's going to take some time, um, and that's okay. That should be expected. And so if you have a patient long-term view, uh, what ends up happening is you now start building the right products rather than just trying to build products that uh, can kind of catch people's attention you know, in a week or two weeks, uh, but then don't make it a year or two years. Okay, the, the, the last thing you said, I think I'm going to put a big highlight in the video. <laughs> Everyone needs to, to listen to that. So the following question is uh, regarding the digital coins that uh, many countries are coming up with, such as Sweden or China that is projecting on, on developing the digital yuan. What are your thoughts uh, on, uh, on this topic? How do you think it could affect us as, a, as an ecosystem? And the second question is, do you think the recession that we are facing right now could help people realizing what Bitcoin is and what it represents finally, because in 2008, it was too early. Yeah. Um, so I always say that money doesn't have a technology problem. Money's got a monetary policy problem. And what I mean by that is um, whether you have the US dollar in the fiat format, like actual physical cash in an electronic format where it kind of is all in a centralized database, or you digitize it in some way, it's still the US dollar. So it's the same monetary policy. So you're just changing the technology form factor, but the dollar still the dollar. If you go around the world, same thing. So the problem is not the technology because when you digitize the dollar, there isn't that big of a difference for most people in the United States, right? Yeah, maybe it's a little bit more accessible to some people around the world or whatever. We don't change that much. All money in the existing world has a monetary policy problem. And so where I think we're going to get is every currency in the world, whether they're um, digital first or digitally native currencies like Bitcoin, uh, ETH, et cetera, or they are fiat currencies, they're all going to be digitized. So you're going to have the U.S. dollar and Bitcoin will have very similar digital uh, structure. Uh, some of them might be uh, decentralized, some might be centralized, but they'll all be digital. The competition is going to happen at the monetary policy level. And so now people are going to have a choice. Do I want to put my wealth into the dollar, into the yuan, into the yen, into uh, Bitcoin, into something else? And what I believe is going to happen is when all else is held equal on the technology front and everything is just as accessible as everything else, people will choose Bitcoin because of its transparency and its lack of manipulation um, in terms of the monetary policy. And so that's a 10, 20 year type time frame. But I ultimately think that's what's going to end up playing out here. And so um, that's why I spend most of my time, you know, focused on and, and uh, trying to just wrap my head around how this plays out. I really hope that happens uh, because here in Argentina, for example, we live in a constant crisis. Uh, we have uh, inflation and we are on a way to hyperinflation and the country is going to default. So, and I don't see people taking action and I don't see people studying money. Uh, and I'm talking about middle-class people, like people who have internet connection and, and, and have those things. So that is, uh, I hope that happens. I don't, we don't know when human behavior is a thing that we always need to keep in mind and how uh, humanity is perceiving those values. I think things like a, a pandemic or a recession of this magnitude need to happen in order for people to wake up. But I'm constantly doubting if that is the case because uh, here is a disaster and no one is taking action. So we'll see. Yeah, and I think that a lot of what you end up seeing, right? I, I've never been to Argentina, so I can't speak to that country specifically, but I think just structurally this happened in many places around the world where mm -hmm. the average person doesn't understand what's happening. Right, they don't understand about currencies, devaluation, inflation. All, none of that makes sense to them, right? Because they, they just don't have the time to look at it. They don't understand it. They're not interested in it. Whatever. What they do know, though, is why did the loaf of bread used to cost you know one dollar or one Bolivia or whatever it is, and now all of a sudden it costs ten, right? It's everything around me is getting more expensive, but I'm not actually making more money. 
and therefore I can't get ahead. I'm, I'm falling behind, right? And that's where the, the effects of hyperinflation or, or high levels of inflation are really felt, I think. And so what you end up getting is uh, it's almost like people don't understand the problem, but they are negatively affected by the problem. And so what hopefully will happen, right, the work you're doing and, and others is educating them on this is why it's happening. This is how it's actually happening. And here are the options of what you can do to protect yourself, your wealth and your family. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we will continue with the work. We're here to stay forever, decades to come. So next question is the question that everyone is uh, waiting for. Uh, the halving is one month away. So price predictions from pump for the halving in a short term perspective and a long term perspective. Do you think we're going to get to a new all time high and when? <laughs> Yeah. So I, I don't know what's going to happen in the short term. Um, you know, I, I tend to avoid kind of any short term price predictions uh, just because it's a hyper volatile asset. And then on top of that, you've got this liquidity crisis happening in the macro environment. Um, so kind of all bets are off. Uh, but over a long period of time, um, you know, in long period in, in Bitcoin terms is like call it 18 to 20 months. Right. So kind of end of 2021, uh, I think Bitcoin will hit one hundred thousand dollars in U.S. dollar value. Um, and, uh, and really the reason for that is a combination of the macro environment with the habit structure. And what I mean by that is, uh, you, in the macro environment, uh, especially in the United States, you've got a zero interest rate environment, other places in the world, you have negative interest rates. Uh, so cost of capital is very cheap. You then have a massive quantitative easing. You know, in the United States, we've announced uh, $2 trillion in stimulus. There's probably more to come. Uh, and Japan just approved an almost $1 trillion stimulus plan. There, there's many other countries around the world that are injecting liquidity into their economies. And so what ends up happening is they're devaluing their currencies. And when that occurs, people are going to seek out inflation hedge assets like gold, Bitcoin, real estate, et cetera. And so right when everyone is running to gold, Bitcoin, real estate, and others, uh, Bitcoin's going to have this supply shock. 50% of the incoming daily supply will disappear. And so if you wanted the price to stay stable, you would have to see a decrease in current demand along with the decrease in incoming supply. At minimum, I don't think you're going to see that. I think you'll continue to see uh, kind of the same level of demand or more likely you're going to see an increase in demand over time. And so if you get that increase in demand, but you get a decrease in incoming supply, supply demand economics take over and you get an increase in price. And so that's where Bitcoin's volatility really comes in, where other assets, if they go up, you know, four or 5%, the equivalent in Bitcoin's term of a four or 5% increase in like public equities is like a 10 to 20% increase in Bitcoin price, right? That, that on a kind of historical relative basis. And so to me, it's, it's a thing where, uh, Bitcoin has a very binary outcome. It's either worthless or it's going to be worth, you know, millions of dollars a coin um, at some point in the future. I tend to think that obviously we're going to head towards it being worth a lot more than it is today. And on top of that, I think that uh, after the halving, within the kind of the first 18 months of the halving, give or take, we will see a very material increase in price. My guess is that we'll see kind of $100,000 by the end of uh, December 2021 at a minimum. Okay. Okay. And so for the people who are in the space right now, they have already been here for a while. And those are the people who are here to stay. Uh, what are your suggestions in terms of education for these people? Like, what do you personally keep an eye on or keep on educating yourself uh, to have a maximum perspective? Because let's say those people have a basic understanding or an intermediate understanding how the technology works. What are, besides from a technology, technological point of view and from those other macroeconomical factors that could happen or change the current state of the market, what should we keep an eye on? Yeah, I, I think that there's um, a couple of things. So one is definitely the underlying data points, right, or kind of fundamentals, if you will. So things like hash rate, uh, active wallets, transactions, all that kind of stuff is important. Along with that, I also look at uh, what percentage of uh, Bitcoin has been held for 12 months, 24 months, five years, et cetera, um, and not been moved because those are kind of the long-term strong-handed holders, um, which are important. Then on top of that, uh, I look at the macro economy, right? And, and to me, it's, uh, this is less about people running to Bitcoin. It's much more about people running from the macroeconomic uh, challenges and, and problems. And so when that happens, what you need is you need those problems to be surfaced, right? It's no shock to anybody. There was over leverage in the system. 
it's no shock that the fiat currency that you hold, no matter where you are in the world, continues to lose value year after year in purchasing power terms, right? So what ends up happening is more people get educated about how money works and they go to leave those assets, right? They're running from that. Well, where do you run to? Gold, Bitcoin, real estate, et cetera, right? And so I think that it's less about people running to Bitcoin and more the majority, kind of the, the, uh, the main adoption is going to happen, people running away from the macro economy, um, and they'll seek out something like a Bitcoin as a, as a solution. And then when you look in the bucket of gold, Bitcoin, real estate, et cetera, Bitcoin to me just has the most asymmetric upside, right? It has the ability to increase hundreds of percent at a time, uh, can also go to zero. So you kind of have a full volatility, whereas gold is pretty stable. Um, yeah, it might increase or decrease in price, but it'll stay pretty stable. Same with real estate. Um, and so if you're, you know, relatively young and, uh, and you understand money, economics, et cetera, uh, and you want that asymmetric kind of high risk, uh, bucket, then, uh, then Bitcoin's a great thing to put in that bucket for you. I think you, with that answer, you answer the, my next question, which is for the people who, who are in the space or, or need to listen to, to this answer or question one more time, what, what is Bitcoin for you and why are we bullish? For the long term you have already answered it but yeah to, to me I, I honestly do look at it as uh, wealth protection right and so what i think about is every time that i buy bitcoin i'm literally taking dollars that lose purchasing power year after year and i'm converting them to something that is protected it is a hedge um, and, and so what I go through is a calculation of how, uh, how much protection do I want versus how much do I want in, uh, in U.S. dollar cash, right? I'm notorious for, uh, I don't make tons of, uh, of investments personally. Um, I don't own no public equities other than a GBTC uh, in a retirement account. Um, I've got a couple of uh, illiquid kind of private investments um, in the startup world. Uh, I own a little bit of real estate, but other than that, it's cash and Bitcoin. Um, and, and the thought process there is really just trying to protect, uh, but have liquidity, but have that protection from inflation um, and, and any sort of issues in the structural uh, macro market. Yeah, perfect. And the last question, uh, Anthony, it, we're living through two different crises from a health perspective and from an economical perspective. Um, I don't live in the U.S., but what, how much time do you think is it going to take us uh, for the economy to recover? Like, how do you see it uh, in the summer or in the fall this year? And uh, usually, how much time do we need to, the economy to slowly start recovering again? I think people are very confused right now. And they, if they are thinking that we are going to have a, a quick recovery, they've lost their minds. Um, and what I continue to tell people is, I don't want to hear anyone talk about a potential recovery until we all get to leave our homes because it's impossible to have an economic recovery while we're all sitting at home, right? Yeah. And so once we all get out of our homes, then it goes to, well, if you've ever run a business, you can't fire all your employees, right? Send them all home. And then tomorrow say, okay, we're starting up again, call everyone back, have them show up, start your business and have every customer come in at the same pace and, and frequency that they were previously. It just doesn't happen that way. Right. And so I think that this is going to be a long road to recovery, but I also don't think the worst is over yet. Right. I actually mm -hmm. think that we're just starting. I, I think this is going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Um, it wouldn't surprise me to see public equities drop, you know, double digit percentages from here. Um, it wouldn't surprise me to see, you know, 25 to 50 percent of U.S. small businesses not make it out of uh, this and, and continue operations. Uh, current unemployment is uh, somewhere in the eight to nine and a half percent, depending on how you count. Uh, my guess is that we could see 15% unemployment, um, you know, very quickly here by the end of this year, for sure. Um, and then GDP. I mean, I, I could easily see 15, 20% drop in GDP this year. And so when you start seeing those numbers, you're like, I, there's no way that you just have that happen and then turn it back on and have a record year the next year in terms of you have all time highs in stock markets or anything like that. I, I just don't see it happening. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so what I continue to tell people is, look, you, you got to get protected, right? You got to make sure you can weather a storm for 12, 18, 24 months. Uh, you've got cash on hand to be able to do that. Um, you know, just like a business has to be now prepared. How do we survive with zero dollars in revenue for multiple months? How do you as a family survive with zero dollars in income, 
right? And, and, and there's not a lot of people in a good position. So you got to do the best you can right now to get in a position where you could withstand something like that. But I definitely don't think that this is going to be a fast recovery. Um, and I also don't think that we've seen the worst of it yet. Yeah. Are you worried about criminality and people starting to do criminality, starting to grow in, in the U.S. as well? Yeah, so look, every country is definitely different when it comes to this, right? I actually, uh, I, I joke all the time. I, I spent a bunch of time in the U.S. Army, and uh, part of the beauty of the United States is the democracy and the personal freedoms, et cetera. But that also leads to less ability for law and order, right? And what I mean by that is uh, in the United States, uh, you can't just go pick up random people on the street, right? That's illegal, and it should be illegal. Uh, in other countries, you can do that right? You can literally just pull up and put people in jail and, and do all kinds of very uh, authoritarian type uh, policing. Well, what happens is you have very little crime, but you also take everyone's uh, personal freedoms, right? No one has the freedom to, to go do this criminal activity. And so in the United States, we've chosen, I think rightfully so, to give people personal freedom and civil liberties. But what that leads to is they then have the ability to go do criminal activity if they choose. And we kind of retroactively punish them rather than proactively prevent them from doing things. And so when that occurs, you need a police force, right, to provide protection. And then also the individuals have to be protected. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing in the United States that's really interesting, uh, there was a day last week where 18% of the New York Police Department called in sick. So right at a time where you're seeing um, they're letting some people out of jail who are nonviolent offenders, right, because of the coronavirus fears, et cetera, you're then seeing people get desperate. People are losing their jobs. They don't have food, right? All, all of those things that tend to lead to alcohol and drug abuse, homelessness, criminal activity, et cetera, you then also are seeing 18% of the police force not be able to go into work. And so it kind of has these compounding effects. Now we haven't seen any sort of like rioting, social unrest, or like true uh, increases in criminal activity. We've actually seen decreases in things like the homicide rate, et cetera. But over time, the longer that this lasts, the more desperate people become. Right. And, and so what I tell folks is like, look, one, you regardless of whether we're in a crisis or not, you've got to be able to take care of yourself and your family. Right. And if you can't do that, then you know, that, that's a whole different case. If you're waiting on the government to save you or, or the police department to save you or whatever, good luck. But on top of that, we do need to make sure that those services are available and those um, you know, police forces, et cetera, are available for people to provide some law and order. Um, and, and so I, I don't think we have that problem yet. But two, three more months of this. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's just human nature. People got to eat, right? And, and I always ask somebody, if you if you or your family hadn't eaten for two, three, four, five days, what would you do? People go do crazy shit, right? And it's that yeah. a necessity. And so I think, you know, we, we just got to try to avoid that from happening. And so far, you know, it hasn't happened, which I think is a good thing. Yeah, that is that is a good uh, phrase to, to, to finish the video. We'll see what happens in uh, third world countries. It is more uncertain and more scary, I would say. But uh, yeah, thank you so much, Pump, for, for being here and for your time. I look forward to maybe meet you in any conference that we attend. And uh, I hope the Spanish speaking community got to know you this time. And yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. A absolutely. I appreciate it. I love all the videos you guys put out. And uh, please keep educating folks. You guys are doing a great job. And uh, I will, I'm sure we'll uh, run into each other soon. Thank you. Have a good day.